Bible tells me so. I remember when my little children learned that, I did not grow up learning such songs. So I remember my children would come home from learning those little songs and they barely just learning how to talk and sing. What a precious sound to hear little children. And you also too, you little children, singing it as well. Ecclesiastes chapter number three. What a sweet time in praise and worship. We continue our study in where we started a few weeks ago. Uh, Ecclesiastes, what a interesting and uh, it's going to become even a deeper uh, teaching book. It's a, a place where, again, we're reminded that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The Word of God, the uh, book that you've opened up on your lap, or the electronic version, as it may be, that you have opened to Ecclesiastes 3 is, uh, is God's Word. And uh, it's inspired by God. It is put together by God, and every word in it is from him for us. That's a pretty good deal, because you know when you open it up, God did not make any mistakes or accidents when it came to putting it together, and so we're in a study of search for purpose in everything. Our theme verse in our study is found in chapter number one, and uh, we uh, set it up there every single week Verse number 13, and I gave my heart, and this terminology is used often, we'll see it again today, Solomon, wisest man, richest man of his time, and it says that no one was wiser before or after him in the scriptures, um, it says that he gave his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom, so he was going after some things, he wanted to find things out, and he was seeking and searching, but he was doing it by wisdom. Now, was he doing it by the wisdom of God or by the wisdom of this earth, of this world? And they are two different wisdoms. And this is the man who wrote so much of your Proverbs, and we will reference our Proverbs in our introduction like we do and we have every time we've come into this study, and this will be our fourth message in there, an introduction in our third chapter. We go, okay, this is a man filled with wisdom who said some very wisdom-filled, God-honoring statements in your Bible he says, I'm going to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And he says, the second half of this verse, something quite interesting. He says, hey, it's sore travail <laughs> that God has given, hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. You think, and our first message was entitled Proper Exercise, our introduction, you exercise properly, you're going to get the benefit from it that you're supposed to do when you exercise in the Bible, your Bible time. If it's just you to get it done with, just like your exercise may be physically, uh, I got to do some sit-ups and some push-ups and, uh, you know, do some leg lifts maybe and, and ride the bicycle. By the way, I don't know anything about that personally. You know, I don't know. I haven't done that in 40 years, but I heard it's really good to exercise properly. But you say, well, I'm supposed to do 50 sit-ups, and you do five. That's not exercising properly. You say, well, well, actually, in my condition, doing five sit-ups right now would be probably a minor miracle. So I guess I would consider that. But the proper exercise is not just to go do it to get it done, which is oftentimes the way we approach the Bible. Sometimes the way we approach coming to church. I just, uh, when is this going to be over? Well, we just started. And I usually preach for like 90 minutes to 100 minutes, so we aren't going to get out of here until afternoon. But you guys say you only care about seeing the Chiefs. So what, are they, what time do they play tonight? 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock? Good deal. Just kidding. But we're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to teach through 22 verses in chapter number 3. And then at the end, we'll have a couple of small lessons that will tie together to um, the title of our message here in a moment. See, search for a purpose in everything tells me that there has to be the proper exercise or there can be the lazy 
person's exercise. There can be a place where I see problems or I see opportunities. That was chapter number one. There could be a place where, as we looked at last week, I could be chasing my tail, chasing one's tail, which is what we looked at in chapter number two. Vanity, vanity. We looked at all the things that are vain and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of this glory and grace. Born again people, when we go to heaven, this stuff and earth, boom, gone. But the person that's lost... When they leave here, they're going, that was the high point of my existence. See, the lost person lives on this earth and says, eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow I may die. Some people might say, well, happenstance, things happen to everybody. Uh, I don't know, it's just the way fate is, and I guess I'm just going to go with it, and uh, that's life, and fine, that's okay. Well, when Solomon gets into chapter number three here, We're reminded of, and it's possible for many of you, that this would be the one chapter that you know in Ecclesiastes or part of it. You might know the part about um, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a season. And some people say, yeah, I remember that one. I've heard it. Maybe this scripture read at a funeral. When I uh, uh, did my father's funeral um, up in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, when he passed away a number of years ago, this was the passage that God led me to and, uh, and then incorporated the gospel there in the midst of many, many family members that basically, are, uh, well, they're lost. They don't see Jesus Christ and have never received Christ as Savior. So this was a big thing here, dad, friend, everything. And so reading that passage allowed me to walk into a more meaningful meaning of life, which is to find your purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's a great introduction. So some of you might have heard this passage of Scripture. You may have remembered the song by the birds from the 60s, right? The time to every purpose under heaven. Time to, no, right? Would you like me to sing it for you? No, I will not. No, no. I can have you come up. We'll do it together. But again, <laughs> we won't do that. Our life has a lot of different seasons, And there's certain time frames and uh, time-stamped things that have gone on. And many of you who have lived a few years would say, boy, I remember this, and I can remember this, and there was a great time of this, and a great time for that, and I can't wait for this next time. And then some of you, you're younger. You know, the old phrase goes something like this. When you're younger, you can't wait till you get older. And when you're older, you wish you never stopped being young. Well, Solomon talks about that today. A time for every purpose under heaven. So let me kind of bring a little bit of thought for you to get you kind of into this place of Scripture and what God's leading us to do. The first thing up on the screen is a statement. Life is comprised of various time periods, and I, I mentioned a little bit of that already. There's seasons that prove, really, that God is the giver of grace and justice. He is a giving God. He is a gracious God. But he's also a just God. These seasons, they prove that God is the God of life and death. He is the giver of opportunities. He's the giver of obstacles. He's the one that will try your heart. He's the one that will be right there. But the Bible also teaches us in Scripture there are times where the nation of Israel and how that they turned their back on God. So God said, I'll let you wander for 40 years. And God gave them exactly what they wanted. There'll be times when God will be the God of justness in such a way that you'll go, wow, why was he so just on that matter? But then he let that one go. Oh, don't, don't, don't be worried about that. God will make sure that he cares for everything and takes care of everything in his time, in his way. But again, life is comprised of various time periods, different seasons, and they all prove that God is the giver, the giver of grace, the giver of justice, the giver of life, the giver of death. So do we really embrace each day? This is a personal question for you. I start out with a we, but do we really embrace each day in each season of life that God places us in for his purpose. 
in the midst of your current life situation, your current state, your current moment, your current period, whatever it is, it might be a season of something that's really a high point. It might be a season of low point. It is said, you know, if you were given 80 days and you split it up into 20s, that you have a spring, summer, winter, and fall of your, of your life. Well, <laughs> just want you to know the winter ain't that great. I just want you to know. I hit my winter a couple years ago. And some of you really like winter, don't you? Don't you? Come on, how many of you like winter? Raise your hand. Two people, three people. There's some of you like winter. Wait till you get to be over 60 if that's the winter of your life. You're going, eh, I don't like winter so much. Yeah. I know Dwayne likes winter because it kills all the stuff. By the way, he's like his voice, oh! You could tell that his pipes are getting all cleared out. He's oh gosh, thank you for the winter, God. That's a wonderful season for some people. But hey, personally speaking in your life, do you, do you really want to run away from the season that God has you in? Do you want to get away from where you're at or you want to stay in it? Because God has put you in this purpose-filled season of life. Even Solomon clearly said in his Proverbs some things about the day you're in the day that we wrestle with, but also, too, the day that we can rejoice in. It says in Proverbs chapter number 21, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You go into battle, maybe you have a day that's coming up that's against, you're going to have to go up into battle and against something. God says, hey, I've got your resources for you. The horse is prepared for it. But remember this, there's safety in the Lord, and the safety comes from the Lord. It says in Proverbs 22, that thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Again, Solomon wrote this about seasons of life, the time of life, the day you're in, and how you approach this season. Right now, this moment, this is your spot that God has for you in your life. What season do you have? Don't look around at everybody else's season. In fact, we're listening to Solomon talk about his own life, but he's also making a general statement over life for everyone, which again goes back to how he wrote some of these incredible Proverbs. It says in Proverbs 24, if thou faint in the day of adversity. You ever have any days of adversity? You've gone through some tough stuff? All of you have. But if you faint in those days, it tells you very simply your strength is small. Do you like fainting when the day of adversity comes? When the season of life where things are tough? Boy, I wish I could get out of that season of life that I'm in. It seems like it's just perpetual. It never goes away. It never goes away. But it's amazing how the day of everything going really, really well that went good for like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years, twenty years. Man, I just... And then all of a sudden, we hit a time in life and seasons where, man, you, oh, I had a great week this week, except for the day of adversity, and I just fell apart. Okay. That could be a possibility of something normal in our life. But our faith, our strength comes from the Lord, and he says... The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Who is it that's going to give me strength? It's going to be the Lord. It also says in this well-known proverb, 27.1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Sometimes we go, okay, that's a great day, but I can't wait for tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Or you might say, Boy, I tell you what, I got it going on this week. Man, I got some mojo happening. I don't care, bring it on. I'm going to have a great day tomorrow. It's going to be the best. I'm going to kick it. I'm going to be the man. Woohoo! And then tomorrow shows up. And everything, oh my. Now, we do have to interject this little commercial. Boy, oh boy, we are dramatic people. Do you know I had a hangnail and I couldn't do anything for a month? Oh, my goodness. I need to go see the doctor. I know there's serious things. I'm with you. There's serious stuff. But sometimes we get dramatic over the adversity days. 
And then we get dramatic over the good days. And we live in extremes everywhere. And the Bible says, rest in the Lord. Be still and know that I am God. Trust in me. Delight in me. Give thanks to me. He'll steady you. He'll give you high points. You'll smile and laugh. And I mean, the Bible does say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be sad in it. No, let's rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Now, what does Bobby do every single morning when you come here on Sunday? He, like, attacks every one of you, doesn't he? You come in like this and, how are you doing over there? How's everything going? Just leave me alone. I want to be done. <laughs> you need to rejoice in the Lord today. That's okay. I just hurt my own ear yelling. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, guys. So what season of life are you in at this time? Because we're to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We're to give thanks in everything, yes. It's easy for you to say, yeah, okay, I know. It's easy for everyone else that's not in your seat, not in your condition, not in your season to say, you should rejoice in that. Yes, I should. But you ought to quote the scripture. So that you're saying, God says in his word that we should give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It says in the Bible and everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. See, when you quote the scriptures, it's so much better. Because even for today, in this moment, do you really see God's purpose right now? Do you? Do I? Because this is a season. Tis the season. Tis the season. And not tis the season to be jolly. Though you know that's why I put it up there. Fa la 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 la. Tis the season. You know, this time of the year is the most Wonderful time of the year. For some it is. For some it's the hardest time of the year. It's a season of life where people are reminded and confronted with their losses and their hurts and their pains. And then they go, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out, time out, time out, time out. Tis the season to rejoice in the Lord hallway. And again I say rejoice. That goes on inside of here. See, sometimes people say, well, we act as fake and phonies and we, we... No, sometimes people are really doing really well despite their circumstances of life because they've learned in the Word and by the Spirit and by the living God named Jesus Christ that everything's going to be all right, that everything's going to be okay. And this is the day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it even when it's hard. Even when you're thinking all those things that come to your mind, when the fear comes up and he says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. See, that's Jesus Christ. That's the living word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was God and the word was with God. That's Jesus Christ. He came to bring light in the midst of the darkness and you are his ambassador. And we have that ambassadorship so that the season that we're in, guess what? It's the season that you're in. God gave you this season. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter number three, we've got 22 verses. I'm gonna teach you through them in about the next 20, 25 minutes, just kind of like I said last week, we're taking an approach of, hey, this is kind of like a, this is our collective devotion. We've got a little devotion we're taking. We're just not taking a look at the outline. We're going to say, okay, we've got all these Bible verses, and maybe you've got little notes that you take. Maybe you've got a little, and you put some things down, and God shows you different things. It's the third or fourth time you've been through this particular chapter in your Bible. Maybe through your Bible reading, you've got little notes in there. It's okay. Well, okay, Pastor, what do we got today? What, what are these next few verses going to be like? What is it that God's going to show us in our devotional time? Because this is First Bible Baptist Church devotional time for 1030 service today. Let's see what God has. You said, well, you did it at 9 o'clock. Did you treat that differently? 
I ask God to give us whatever we're supposed to have in this moment, in this this time, in this day, in this season right now. So whatever God brings, I'm praying it's what God would have all of you to hear, most of all to give him glory. I'm going to look at the first eight verses. Let's look at them first. Chapter number one, uh, chapter three, verse one. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Pretty simple stuff, right? I mean, straightforward life stuff. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. Now, as I mentioned earlier today, and I think that it behooves repeating, this is what my wife knows about Ecclesiastes is only this verse. A time to keep silence. That's all she ever tells me. I didn't even, I mean, she hasn't memorized a lot of Bible, but she's got this verse down. And then she doesn't ever complete the verse and say a time to speak. She never says that. So, thank you for allowing me to speak today, everybody. I appreciate that. (laughs) A time to love. I love verse number eight. A time to love and a time to hate. Why do you love it? Because if you did not know what hatred looked like, you wouldn't know how beautiful love is. If you didn't know evil and how wicked it is, you wouldn't know how beautiful goodness is. You see, without darkness, you don't know the sweetness of light. It says there, a time of war and a time of peace. Why do you like that? Because clearly I love peace. The peace that passes all understanding. The Prince of Peace, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. I mean, that's Jesus Christ. He is peace. He is our peace. You see, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. This is man's time, very simply. So this is our first little spot to stop. A time for everything. This is man's time. You see, Psalm 139 tells us that God wove us in his time in the womb of our mothers. He genetically put us together. He structured us exactly the way he wanted us. And he said, I'm making you the way I want you. And I look at Psalm 139 verse 14 and say, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am God's creation. When I got saved, born again, and called on the name of the Lord to save me, I became a new creature, a new creation in Christ. All things passed away. Behold, all things have become no, new. Man's time is being confined to, yeah, that's just regular life stuff. And again, you wouldn't argue with those things. There are things that come and things that go. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to get up that which, or pluck out that which is planted. No problem. These are pretty easy to understand. And they're pretty basic life stuff. But if all of these man's times things is all that we do to mark time, then we don't go anywhere. We just keep on marking time. There is something really cool about getting a workout on a stationary bike, but where does the bike go? Nowhere. That's why I'm so against exercise. (laughs) Well, go get yourself a real bike. I don't want to get run over. No. The principle of the exercise within it is awesome, but it's a thought of, hey, if all I look at is there's a time of this, a time of that, a time of this, and that's all there is, and I say, I'm just going to mark time until I die and go home, and wherever I go, I'm just going to take a dirt nap, and I'll be done. I'll turn into worms, and that'll be it. I guarantee you, if you've talked to anybody in this life, you have heard that from somebody. I know I have more than once. It says in Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God, the days of years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they are fourscore, yet 
is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. I thought I would stay 30-something years old all my life. Now, am I a child? Yes, I am. But the years march on, and without Jesus Christ, man's time is just man's time. If he says, hey, we have to cooperate with God's timing on everything, great, let's do that. God brings this in, God brings that in, that's the way it's going to go. These events come and these events go, that's great, and these are just normal, natural, regular man's times things, that's good. But Solomon just basically said, that's it. Not, that's just good, but there's more. Verses number 9 through 11. What profit hath he that worketh in the wherein he laboreth? What, what he's basically saying is, what profit is there in working? In the work that someone labors in. That's kind of like what he said last week. It's just vanity to do all this work and all this labor and get nothing out of it. And then leave it to someone who's just going to blow it away. Verse number 10, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised therein. He hath made everything beautiful. I like this now. Sounds like Solomon's kind of getting it here. He's just being reminded back of God and his presence and everything. He's made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. This is man's ignorance. What do you mean, man's ignorance? Well, the simple definition of ignorance is a lack of knowledge or information. Listen, do, has anybody gone to heaven and come back and has an accounting of what it's like there? Has anybody been in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ physically in a spirit state and been able to say and come back from heaven? You see, man is ignorant of that information. We do not know. What he's saying there is a great truth if we get proper perspective. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, Agreed. Also, he has set the world in their heart. What? What? Yeah. You are born into this world, and the world is set in your heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Because guess what? You and I are concerned all about what you and I are concerned all about. That's why we have to fight this selfish nature we have of the world that we, have, that we are living in. Let me make a simple illustration. This is my world, and I'll let you know if you're welcome to be in it. It's my world. It's my little universe, and I may give you permission to be in my world, and I may not. Wait a minute. Can I come into your little world? Nope. You see, man's ignorance is about the eternal life with God because we're set in a place of this world and we're stuck on our own little world. And Solomon's very clearly saying, he's made everything beautiful in his time, but sometimes people in general, I will say general, and maybe this applies to many of you, do not have a whole lot of knowledge or information on this incredible God that has made everything beautiful in his time. You see, your outlook of being really, really confined will mess with the outcome of something. Because there might be a great outcome in something, and yet your outlook has been rather blah. You see, perspective can really change how we see God at work and go after the things that oftentimes we are ignorant of. Verses number 12 and 13, they'll tie together with 14 and 15 here as well. We read 12 and 13. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. What are we saying here? This is man's blessings. Hey, all the works that you worked and all the labors that you've labored and all the things that God has made that are beautiful in his time, I know that there is no good in them but for man to rejoice, to do good in his life. Really? So God can't work through all the things that he's given you, all the possessions that he's allowed you to make and give, uh, and given you, all the blessings that God has given you and you're saying, no, 
These are man's blessings. It's the gift of God. God is forever man is not apart from God. So how do you enjoy this life? Enjoy the blessings of God, not because you got them, not because you're responsible for them, but because God gave them to you. Man's life can be enjoyable. The preacher says, if you see that it's God that made everything beautiful. But if all you see is this labor and toil, if you say all these works that you have done are useless like we talked about last week, then you're going... I have no blessings in my life except for the things that I made a blessing to in my own life. I'm the one who's responsible for all my blessings. Woo! It says in Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 10, verse 6, blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Let me just say very simply in this spot right here that you and I are blessed beyond measure. That you and I, man's blessings, and they do not come because you are a United States citizen, though you think that's the reason why. You really do. Wake up, everybody. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We fight for what we fight for. And we'll fight, go, we'll go down fighting. But I promise you this one thing. If you think that your blessings are tied together to a man somewhere or a woman somewhere in power, if you really think that that's how you get your blessings or you're just going to make everything happen in your own life, please be careful that you are not going to live in a place that Solomon is. Miserable, full of a vanity life, and filled with a vexation of spirit attitude. The blessings you have and I have come from God. Period. And whatever beautiful constitution we have, which there's nothing like it on the face of the earth, that had to be scripted somehow, some way, by men that feared God. But that's okay. Because if that took away and got taken away, my blessings come from God, Almighty God. And Solomon knew that and understood that even in his mess. The next one is 14 and 15. I know that whatsoever God doeth, he shall do it forever. Uh, he shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. <laughs> it's like, God, you do whatever you want to do. God's doing whatever he wants to do, and God can do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't need my permission. Verse 15, that which hath been is now. And that which is, excuse me, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. It says up there, man's plight. Things cycle through. Things cycle through. Things cycle through. God did this for man for a period of time for a generation, and then another generation, another generation, another generation. The difference maker has always been holy God. The difference maker has always been Jesus Christ. The difference maker has always been the Holy Spirit of God, the great three in one. That's why it says, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man, us. You see, it's always been that way on God's side. On man's side, it's man's plight. You don't have anything to do with creation. Though God gives you the ability to plant some seeds in a, in a garden and, and make something beautiful. God allows you to take some wood and turn it into something that changes a child's life. That's God's blessing. But on man's plight, if that wood stays a tree, it just stays a tree. You see, man's plight is that you have to and I have to realize that everything comes from God. When we truly, properly feel the Lord, then we have no need to fear anything else. May I please repeat that? When you and I truly fear God properly then we don't have to fear anything else. Just fear the Lord. That then leads you to do what he wants you to do. And it leads you to getting wisdom and understanding and knowledge and go, oh gosh, God. But man's plight in his own way gets us to a thing where you go, okay, at the end of the day, this is all I got, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, yeah. At the end of the day, believers, why don't we just glorify God? and enjoy him forever. We need to remember and recognize and realize that us, man, 
that all of us, all of who you are, is all in his time, in his will. You and I belong to God, and we're in his hand. Verse number 16. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. This is man's judgment. We have this phrase going on a lot now, don't judge me, don't judge anything, judge, I, I, I know, I know. So how do you and I think that we're going to escape the judgment of God? He's going to judge believers. And he's going to judge those that are not believers. It'll be a different judgment. But how is it we think that we're never one day going to be having to give an account? We have to. Because God is a perfect, just, holy God. And the righteousness you have, believers in Jesus Christ, comes from Jesus by grace. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, the Bible says. Man's judgment is upon those, again, that have never bowed their knee to Jesus, the wicked And those that have bowed their knee and heart to Jesus and received him as Savior, and he's made us righteous by his blood. But there's still a just and 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 uh, and a fair judgment that's coming, and it will be according to God's ways. Why should the righteous not be judged? How could God give reward or loss of reward? I'm not talking about the judgment for your sin that was paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. If you've never called on the name of the Lord to save you, if you think enough of your righteousnesses or your works are going to save you and get you to heaven and you're going to be able to barter with God, the Bible teaches me, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. When you call on the name of the Lord to save you, you say, I admit that I am a sinner and I acknowledge that he has done all all the work that needed to be done for me. He shed his blood. I believe in Jesus as being the sole, only, complete sacrifice for my sin. And my sin had to be paid for. And now, by the judgment of God, by the cross, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures, I by faith completely put my faith in what Jesus Christ has done. And I confess that he is my savior and he has forgiven me. That's how you get saved and you won't face that judgment that the people that have rejected his sacrifice will face one day. Believers, we will face a judgment one day. Not that judgment. We will face a judgment of all those things that we have done after our salvation. Romans 14 tells us, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, we will have to give an account. And we'll suffer loss and we'll suffer when we'll receive reward, but that's just the way it is. Man's judgment, it's in the Bible. And here's Solomon talking about judgment and being judged. Verses 18 through 21, we're almost done with the whole chapter. Look at this, what a devotion we have. We're just about done covering it. I told you we would do it in about 20, 30 minutes here. Well, I said 20, but now I just added 30. You see how I did that? You were paying attention, weren't you? Here we go. This is man's spirit. We'll get there. I said in my heart, here's that phrase, concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Continue on. Don't just stop at that verse. He said, oh, men are beasts, beasts. No, no. Watch. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As one dieth, so dieth the other. We all will die, correct? Beasts die. We humans will die. Yea, they have all one breath, so that man hath no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. The life giver gives the life. He gives the death. That is our life giver. Verse 20 says, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. We all die, and we all return to the ground, the dust that we came from. No question about that. It says in verse 21, though, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? 
man's spirit. See, man's spirit different than the beast. Even Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, verse number 7, even Solomon, which I believe he did kind of finish pretty well here, we, we wonder his state, but he says something in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, our flesh, the beast's flesh, but something different about man, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Soul, spirit, we are different. Just because you watch cartoons doesn't mean that animals can talk, okay? I just want, just in case you didn't know that, okay, I want you to know. Animation, putting a spirit of man in an animal, that's against God's word. Did you know that? Well, I took the little wind out of your sails, didn't I? It's against the Bible. No, I didn't. Mm-mm. God says, mm-mm, spirit of man is different than the spirit of the beast. We share two things, though. We'll all die, and we all will return to the dust, but our spirit and soul return to the one who gave us that. And if you're born again, your soul is redeemed. It's cut away, and now it's sealed to the day of redemption because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And now as a believer, hey, I'm going back to God. Yay! But the lost person, their soul, will be eternally bound in a godless hell. Because man is different there than the beast. That's man's spirit. And lastly, I see in verse 22 the emptiness of man without Jesus. This is simple but really hard. This verse says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him. Oh my gosh. Look at that verse. For that is his portion. What? To rejoice in his own works. If that's all you and I got, who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? He's saying, who? who? Like, is there really a way of being redeemed? Is there really a way of being reconciled to God? Who, who, who can possibly? You might as well just say that your best way to live. In fact, there's nothing better than a man shall rejoice in his own works. That is man's emptiness. That's man's emptiness. I mean it. This morning, with all the love and grace of the Lord, if you're lost today, there's emptiness. You never ask Jesus to save you, forgive you, and put your faith and trust completely in him. It's empty. It's just wasteless. It's just wasted. It's just useless. Then you come back to, wow, what's the sense? The the tis the season for me is... (laughs) That set time and appointed time that seems to be just vanity, vexation of spirit. The lost person. And Solomon is really giving us a great narrative of what it means to be lost without hope. But you believers this morning, this is a season for you. This is the season that God put you in. In this moment, in this day, in this time, whatever you have in this life right now, in Jesus Christ, this is your season. What are you going to do about it? Well, let me just put two things at you and I'll be done. They'll take about a couple minutes each. But they're tough, so here we go. Number one, in this time of life, you... Me, believer, I'm talking to the believer. You must respond to the tis the season moment that your holy God intentionally placed you in. Why are you looking around for everybody else's moment, everybody else's season? Oh, I wish I was so much younger, so much older. I wish I had your wisdom. I, have, I wish I could be it there. I wish I could have it. I wish I could just be in a different season of my life. I can't stand it what God has put me in. It's time for you and I to stop 
whining and crying in the season we're in and say, okay, God, I'm going to respond to the moment you put me in. You intentionally put me right here. You are right here, right now, in this life. What are you going to do about it? Because the disciples were stuck in a different spot. The disciples were stuck, stuck in a different spot than you are right now. And about 2,000 years ago, Jesus sat down with them. Go John 16. If you can meet me there, I'm just going to start reading it. You can write it down in your notes and check it out later. But here's just one of those interaction times. Jesus Christ is about to go to the cross. He's making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be, he's on his way. He's going to be praying with the Father before he gets to the Garden. It's a different type of prayer. But you look at John 16. It says in verse number 25, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, that the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask my Pete in my name. And I say... Not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from, from God. Very simply, I've been praying for you. I will pray one last time for you. But then you don't have to have that type of thing where I pray to the Father for you. You can go directly to the Father because I'm going to make the way for you. The veil, the temple will rend twain from top to bottom. The wall of partition will come down and my sacrifice, and you can go directly to the Father on your own behalf. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. These guys are going, what are you talking about? Jesus, I don't like the season of life that you got us in because you're going to leave us. He's saying, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. He says in verse number 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb? Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answers them back and says, Do ye now believe? Think of their season. Think of their moment. Think of what God placed them in intentionally, those disciples right there. The one's gone off. Judas is gone. The 11 are there beside him. And he's saying, do you now believe? Verse number 32. Behold, the hour cometh, the is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Here it is, verse 33. These things have I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You think that you're not in the right season of life? You think that you're having a tough time? Oh, it's got to be cycled back. I better get in a good cycle. How about if you just sit right where God puts you and say, I'm going to do all I can by this divine position and divine provision that he has given me, and I am going to do all that he would have me to do in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what you and I need to realize in the season of life. And lastly, in this crisis of belief, you need to rest just simply rest. Okay, I'll say it softer. In this crisis of belief, you need to rest in this tis the season moment that your holy God wills you not to run from. I just want out. I just had enough. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to run away. God says, I got you in this season for a reason. You may not know what it is, but why don't you grasp me and who I am and what I have for you, that my way, my truth, my life in Jesus is the way that you got saved and it's the way you're going to live. And tis the season you need to rest in it and say, okay, okay, God, this is your moment. This is your tis the season moment, and I'm not going to run away from it. You know how many times we want to run away, we want to be dramatic, we want to head out the door, we've had enough, I'm running. Whew. You really think when you show up wherever it is that you're running to, it's going to be any better? Now it's a new season and a different season, and now things are going to cycle through in another way. You might as well just face the realization that God and his incredible, wonderful sovereignty has overcome all of your ego, all of your incredible greatness and my greatness and said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I have this for you. It says Hebrews 3 verses 7 through 13. I read this and close it up. 
is beautiful because holy God says, I don't want you to run. Holy God wills you and I not to run from the tis the season moment that's right now in your life. Whatever it may be. Because I don't know it, but God does. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Hebrews 3, 7. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day, excuse me, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. They turned away from God in the moment that he made for them. That was their divine appointment right there. And they walked away from it. They said, we don't like this season of life that you put us in, God. We want to go back to another place. It's easy to pick on those people in the Old Testament, isn't it? But in the New Covenant, we're the same way. I want to go back to Egypt where the food was so much better. But you'll be enslaved. You'll be in captivity. Oh, that's okay. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The Bible says, in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When you got saved, you got a brand new heart, but that carnal heart still hangs around a little bit, doesn't it? And it draws you to think, ah, this season of life, it's impossible. Ah, this season of life. We end up, instead of exhorting one another on a daily basis, we get stuck with an evil heart of unbelief that God can't deliver us or God wants to just take us through this incredible exodus experience. Whatever it may be, he's saying, tis the season moment. Don't run from it. Don't run. Park right there and let this season give me glory because you're going to spend eternity with me. We finish up with this. How many moments? How many more? My brothers and sisters in the Lord, how many more moments are going to go by? How many more God's season of purpose moments are going to go by? They're just going to pass you right by. Maybe today you just say, no more. No more of those moments where God's season of purpose has got me right here. No more running from what God has for me. It's God's season for us, for each one of us personally in this moment. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your precious and beautiful and powerful word. Thank you for the lessons that we have in Jesus' name here out of the life of Solomon in his later years. Thank you for clearly showing us there is a time for every purpose and there is a season in our lives. And thank you for giving us clarity by your word of how we need to face the season, whatever it is that you've given us. Now I pray in this time of invitation, this time of prayer, that God, you'll have your way. Work on our hearts. May each one of us answer this question. Maybe it's because we have to come forward and do some prayer or we need to do it right there. But God, please be at work in this moment in Jesus' name. As the music plays, please stand. Please, please respond. Maybe, maybe you just want to come up here and just say, I need to answer that question with God. Please come. Please take the time to respond to God's word, God's message, not mine. Please, I pray.